Hello, my name is uh, Jay Chauhan, and I'm here today with Samok Shah, and we'll be talking about the subject of the lawyer-client relationship, and uh, it'll be presented in the format of uh, Samok asking questions, and I'll be answering them. And the topic again is the lawyer-client relationship. I'm a lawyer for 40 years in the, in the province of Ontario, also called the bar in England and India, and have a lot of experience in terms of understanding what is the proper relationship between the lawyer and the client. And I saw in my practice that uh, it does take some understanding on the part of the public to understand how to, to relate to the lawyer. And this video will help as public to understand how you should deal with the lawyer in a proper fashion so that you get the best support for the legal support that you need when you have a legal issue arising in your life. So here is Sohok Shah and he'll ask the questions and I'll respond to those questions. Great. So I think it would make sense to start by asking about the manner in which a lawyer gives advice and how a client would give instructions to the lawyer regarding the particular case at hand. So the fundamental principle that is very often not understood is a question of what is the lawyer doing in terms of his role with the client when you have a legal problem. It is the, the client is, is a person that has a legal issue and the lawyer is the advisor. It is a fundamental relationship similar to a doctor and a patient. So the role of the lawyer is to firstly advise based on the information he receives from the client, then he presents it to the lawyer, and the lawyer makes up his mind and gives him an opinion. Based on that opinion, the client should make a decision as to what he wants to do. So then he follows through the decision making and tells the lawyer, it's called instructions, what he wants the lawyer to do. Then the lawyer follows this through in terms of what the client wanted. So that fundamental understanding that the lawyer's advisor and the client is the person seeking advice is very fundamental to the relationship of the lawyer and the client. Great. Now, I've heard of the term privileged information, and would like to know if that plays a role between the communication between a lawyer and a client. Also, if you could define what privileged information is, that would be great as well. Yes, uh, so look, I think that uh, to make the legal system very functional so that the client gets his uh, legal issue properly presented to the lawyer, he should feel free to tell the lawyer what is really going through his mind. Because the lawyer is not in a common law system a part of the government, as he is in many different countries. But to make it possible for him to be open in presenting his legal problem, the statements made by the client to the lawyer are privileged and confidential. So the lawyer will keep it uh, confidential, will not present it to anybody, and even the court will not ask questions to the lawyer as to what was said in the legal office between the lawyer and the client. And, and that is very fundamental in the, in the whole principle of the law because in the so-called adversarial system, the client may be doing something which in terms of his role in society is right or wrong in criminal cases, for example. In civil cases, it's very confidential as to what he is thinking and what he has done and how to win his position in the court. But all the discussion is totally confidential and therefore is not revealed until the client says, you may reveal what I say to you. So I know that the relationship between a lawyer and client is similar to that of a doctor and patient. And so I'm wondering if the information conveyed in the interaction between a lawyer and client is confidential. Oh, very much so. I think that, you see, that the, the question one is privilege is more relates to the question of what is uh, being told to the court, and therefore it's privileged, and the court will not ask a question. But confidential is a question of the lawyer not disclosing what he heard to anybody in the course of carrying out the client's instructions and the, the procedure that he is following. So that's the distinction between the two. Excellent. So now to change the scene a little bit, during an actual trial, do lawyers get equal hearing before the court? Also, if you could elaborate on what equal hearing is, that would be great as well. I think it's very important to understand, actually, that uh, sometimes in societies, in legal system, the lawyer may be in a, in a small firm 
and he may be opposing a very large law firm, and the large law firms present a big image that they can do much more than a smaller office, is not spoken, but silently understood. But at that time, it is very, very important to understand that in the interest of justice, the court will treat each lawyer as one person before the court. But in terms of the engagement outside the court system, the law firm, a big law firm, may say that we as a whole group will take the responsibility towards the client. But when you come to before the court, it is equal in terms of the rights of the litigants as well as the lawyers who are before the court. Now, I've heard of the term limited engagement retainer. Could you specify exactly what that is? Well, historically what happened, is still happening in a large, uh, a large proportion of the cases, is that law, like medicine, creates a major problem in many people's lives when something goes wrong. At that time, you need a person who is professional, knowledgeable, to lead the decision making and, so to speak, the carriage of the action to conclusion. So at that time, he takes over and says, I put my name on so-called the pleading on the back, I take the responsibility, I'll get the documents from the other side. It takes a lot of pressure away from the, the client in terms of knowing that the lawyer is defending his position or taking the position of the plaintiff for the client. But at the same time, by doing the whole procedure in that fashion, what happens is that it costs a lot of money because each time you have a call from the other side, lawyers very often click their time by quite one of an hour and it adds up very quickly. So that traditional method of lawyer-client relationship is more recently been adjusted and recognized by the law society in terms of what is called limited engagement retainer. And the way it works is that the client says, I can't afford a lawyer all the time, but I have a critical situation I want you to address, such as preparing a statement of claim, preparing a defense, or a particular hearing. In between, so much more will happen, which I'll handle on my own. So that is called a limited engagement retainer. So in that situation, the retainer simply says, I will, as a lawyer, do a limited part of your procedure but the rest you'll carry out on your own. It's very important at that time to define what the lawyer is going to do because he's not going to carry on and, and finish it off. Okay, so I've heard of the term class action. So in the context of a court hearing, um, could you explain a little bit about what is meant by that? Well, most of the time there are two major types of actions. A criminal action is one where the crown, so to speak, the government, is prosecuting a defendant and the defendant is being defended by a lawyer actually. That's a relationship of state against the person in a criminal action. The second one is one person in a civil action against another person in, a, in, a, in an action, which is civil litigation. But a third category important to recognize is now a class action where the whole society is not involved as in a criminal action, but rather a group of people who are injured in a certain way from the action of a particular company or a plane or a party, for example, a wrong drug. A thalidomide drug, if you remember in the history, created a lot of problems and defects in the, born, the children that were born with mothers who had taken that drug. So that group of people who have a common injury are identified. In Canada, we have the example of the, the Catholic school boards that treated many people of the First Nation people in a very unfair manner. And they were compensated through a class action. And when a class is defined as people with a common interest, it is certified by the court. And then the action is commenced in the name of the group through a, a lawyer who then, then gets a judgment. And then the proceeds of the decision and the funds are then shared by all the people who belong to that class of people